A duck and her ducklings are trapped on a roof. Tough scenario with all these obstacles. An orphaned baby fox arrives at the center with a mystery illness. I held his head up to give him food, and when I let go, his head dropped. He couldn't okay. even hold his own head up. And it's springtime, which means babies, babies, and more babies. The nursery is teeming with orphaned wildlife. It's known as the city within a park. The greater Toronto area is home to one of the most diverse urban wildlife populations in North America. Here, more than 6 million busy humans live alongside 350 different species of wild animals. When wildlife clashes with urban life, it's usually the animals who lose. That's when Toronto Wildlife Centre steps in, saving animals one day at a time. It's 7 a.m. That means feeding time. There are hundreds of babies at the center today and the nurseries are at full capacity. Babies are a lot of work and the staff is focused on getting them all fed and their cages cleaned. But every once in a while, even these seasoned professionals have to stop in awe. Opossums well, are awesome. <laughs> so these guys need six or 6.3. So do you just want to prep a 6.3 for me and I'll figure out who we have. So we are just getting ready to tube feed um, two groups of baby opossums. These babies were found actually inside the pouch of their dead mother. So luckily somebody found their mom in their backyard. Um, she'd passed away so they called animal control to come and pick the mom up. Um, and they just happened to find the babies inside of her. So these are some lucky guys. They are the only marsupial in North America. They have the most teeth of any mammal. An adult opossum has 56 teeth in their head. Um, they have prehensile tails, which means they hold on to things with their tail. Just like this, you can see how she's, she's wrapping her little tail around my thumb. A common misconception about opossums is that they can actually hang by their tails, but they don't hang, they just sort of hold on. It's more for stability than anything. Um, they have pouches, that's how they raise their young. So this little one is a girl. You can, it's hard to see, but she does have the sort of beginnings of a little pouch here on her abdomen. Their ears are not normally green. To identify our opossums, we actually use non-toxic marker and we draw on them a little bit. It's just how we ID each one of them. Ready? Yeah. We are tube feeding them and they don't like it, as you can see. These little guys at this age would normally still be inside of mom's pouch nursing. So we just supplement their feeding with some formula. Um, the one nice thing about opossums is that when they're inside mom's pouch, it is actually normal. They have a nipple that actually goes into their mouth and down their throat a little bit. So they don't have as much of a gag reflex as most mammals. So they take the tubing very, very well, which is nice. No, oh, hold on. I don't like that breathing. Katie stops the feeding. Even the simplest task can't be taken for granted. Her breathing just started sounding a little not right. As you're tubing them, you do have to be very, very careful that you are in their stomach, not in their lungs. And the thing with tubing is that it does come with some risk, obviously. And because they're so small, it can be sometimes hard to tell that you're in the right spot. With the opossums breathing back to normal, Katie continues the feeding. So opossums do have a lot of teeth in their mouths, even when they're babies. They obviously have the potential to bite you, as anything with teeth does. But they are not aggressive animals by nature. Most people have heard the term playing possum. Uh, which is where, you know, you play dead. Um, and these guys are infamous for it. They have their own term. I actually love opossums. They're one of my favorite things. The opossums are introduced to their new enclosure. They'll be cared for until they're strong enough to be reintroduced to the wild. You will find opossums everywhere. They are all over the city. Most people don't know that they're there. They live in people's backyards, they live under decks, under sheds, residential areas, commercial areas. They are almost everywhere. 
They have adapted to city life amazingly well. They, a lot of times, will live off of, you know, they'll eat garbage. They'll eat pretty much whatever they find. They're scavengers. The goal here is to always return the animal to its original habitat. At Toronto Wildlife Centre, living in captivity is only a temporary solution. If everything goes well, the opossums will be returned home within a short time. While the baby opossums are getting used to their temporary home, another group of babies have turned the rooftop patio on this condominium into their home. And the woman who owns it is hoping this is also temporary. I've had a mother duck nesting on my deck for about 35 days. She laid an egg a day. She laid 10 eggs. I live four stories up. There's no way for the mom to get food, water. They like to walk their babies to water when they're born, and there's no way she could do it up there. Andrew and Stacy are both members of Toronto Wildlife Center's rescue team. Okay. Um, so I guess let's just get the regular tools for ducks. I'll get the two nets and our little duckling net. Last year, this same mother duck laid her eggs on the same rooftop patio. Andrew was the one dispatched for the rescue. He knows that catching an anxious and protective mother duck can be a tricky business. If the mother is spooked, she may fly away, leaving her babies behind. How are you? Good. They've been called to the rescue by Karen Taylor, the owner of the condominium. This is her second year. Uh, last year I was very freaked out and wondered why she did it, but last year Andrew from Toronto Wildlife told me she'll probably come back again, um, and he was right. Uh, I'm sure it's the same mom. At the top of the stairs, the team prepares for the rescue, away from the watchful eyes of Mother Duck. Once she sees them, they'll need to act fast. The goal is to cause her the least amount of stress. Without their mother, these babies' chances of survival will be reduced dramatically. They, last year, they went like under into it the next door neighbor. So the reason why we have to come and do this every year is the mom finds a nice safe spot on this beautiful patio uh, on the fourth floor here in this building, but doesn't think ahead the next step of, now my babies have hatched, where do I take them from here? So we're just basically taking them out of a trapped situation. So the mum first, and then what I'll do is stay on the mum in the net, and I'll let Stacy collect the babies. And then when the babies scatter, you just come in, and I'll stay on mum and try to help you with the babies. Tough scenario with all these obstacles. Yeah, what I want to see happen is her go right in the corner, and then I'll go in with the net, and she'll pop right up, is my preliminary thought. Andrew is nervous. He wants to avoid frightening the mom. If she's frightened enough, she may fly away and leave her babies behind. He may only have one chance of capturing her. It's a fine balance between speed and accuracy. Every week, Toronto Wildlife Centre responds to over 100 rescue calls from concerned citizens hoping to save an injured or abandoned animal. Sometimes it's a simple matter of mistaken accommodations. Today, Andrew and Stacy have been called to rescue this family of ducks stranded on a rooftop patio on the fourth floor of this downtown condominium. I'm gonna move the chair, I'm not comfortable at all. Let them settle. They'll all settle in that corner. Maybe I will deal with mom first. Because I think they're all comfy right there. Yeah. Can I have a cage, Karen? Yeah, this little one? Yep. Yeah. some rain. You good? I'm good. If you're good, go ahead, but I think two people would be better. Yeah, I'll, I'll just wait for yeah, you. Just watch them in that corner. I need my help with them. Nice and slow, nice and slow. <laughs> nice and slow. 
Oh, okay, I'll get that one. I'll get that one. Right. Okay, he's on the other side. Got it. It's okay. We'll okay. get him after. Done. So, we got one on the other side. Yeah. Oh, oh, there what do you have? All nine. So, what we're going to do to be sure that we have all of them, we'll count one at a time as they go into the carrier. Let's. I'm going to scramble and just get to the last one. Here she is. Stage one is complete. Baby, bye, sweeties. Success. Yay. Oh, I'm so happy. So how did they get through? Now, next year, what do I do? You, where did she look? The one that got through? Gonna yeah. Just in that last one. Where oh. the cable is. Oh, and I thought I had covered all of it. So I'll take care of that next year. Toronto Wildlife Centre is the largest wildlife rescue facility in Canada. Here, 25 full-time staff and hundreds of volunteers spend their days trying to bring balance to the chaos that erupts when wildlife clashes with urban life. During the busy season, this hotline crew is bombarded with close to 200 calls a day. And today is no different. Hi, I'm Jennifer, I called about the turtle. Okay, great, what kind of turtle is it? I think it's a snapper. I think he's got a cracked shell around the side. Okay, great, so we'll take him to the back. Okay. Okay, um, I'm gonna ask you to hang up for five minutes. Sounds ask awesome. a couple questions, we'll go from there. Okay, okay. Great. Okay, great. Thanks. This morning I was driving my son to daycare and I was just driving down the street in Whitby and at the side of the road I noticed a roundish lump. So I turned around and parked at the side and went over and I could tell right away that it was a turtle, but I wasn't sure if it was alive or not. And when I got closer, he stuck his head out and kind of snapped at me a little bit. I just hoped that he was okay. I want him to get fixed up and go back home. <laughs> the injured turtle has been brought into the assessment room. It's the first stop for every animal that arrives at Toronto Wildlife Center. Here, a wildlife care supervisor and a veterinary technician will examine the animal and determine what is the next step of its treatment. So with snapping turtles, because they snap, we use toilet plungers to cover their face. Yeah. So let's just have a... <laughs> there we go. So, and don't worry, it's a different plunger for turtles than it is for toilets. <laughs> So she has a crack coming down her shell here, a little bit right at the base of her tail. And then it comes up the shell here. Um, and then also a couple more a little down the side over here. Okay, let's just tilt her. There you go. So you can see the yeah. cracks down there. So chances are she was run over by a car. So this is just um, a little bit of soap. It's just chlorhexidine, and we'll just very quickly. You know. So sometimes people will think that turtles can't actually feel, but they can. It's just, you know, I mean, right underneath here, there's soft tissue, there's blood. It's just like uh, if you cracked, say, a nail in half, um, and you could see all the soft tissue under there, and your nail would still be intact, but it would hurt a lot. You know, we've had turtles that literally are missing this much of their shell. Like, vertebra exposed, um, so, like, bone, tissue missing, blood, and if you, you know, we, uh, we'll have to keep those guys for a long time, obviously, they heal quite slowly. Um, but then you'll, you'll see them a year later and it closes right in and it's beautifully healed. Um, so right now, Ashley is just preparing to give her some fluids. And then the other two syringes that are going in are going to be, one is an antibiotic, since she has big open wounds, and the other one is uh, pain medication. And we keep saying she, but we don't actually know that yet. We're gonna have to check that out. The easiest way to tell if your turtle is a girl or a boy is to do x-rays and to see if there's eggs inside. The x-ray also determines the extent of the turtle's injuries. Okay, I'm just gonna get gowned up just in case. 
what we're going to do, which will hopefully work, is we're going to x-ray her when she's inside the box. Um, because x-rays do go through cardboard, and then that way she'll be less stressed as well because she's not exposed um, to everything. She can't see anything. All right, so it is a girl. <laughs> she's full of eggs. Okay. Wow. We're going to have to count these. <laughs> You can actually see the shape of the eggs. And snapping turtle eggs are almost perfectly round. So what we'll do after her first initial few days of being in care, once she's sort of over the hump, so to speak, we will set her up in a house that has some sand and give her the opportunity to lay them as she would. Snapping turtles really like laying their eggs in like a rocky, sandy area. So think of the shoulder of roads out in the country. It's perfect for them. Um, so I would not doubt that she was on her way to find somewhere to lay her eggs. Now this turtle will be given a safe and comfortable place to lay her eggs while her shell has a chance to heal. But just down the hallway, things are not so obvious. Lisa Fosco, Toronto Wildlife Centre's rehabilitation manager, is consulting with veterinarian Heather Reed about an orphaned fox with a mystery illness. Was he pretty weak when you looked at him? Like he was when you really checked weak. in? Yeah. I held his head up to give him food, and when I let go, his head dropped. He okay. couldn't even hold his own head up. And when did he come in? Remind me, he came in yesterday? A local resident found this baby fox roaming the streets without a parent. Obviously weak and disoriented, the fox would not have been able to survive on its own. So the concerned citizen put him in a box and brought him into the center. Lisa and Heather need to find out why he's so weak. It's probably his only chance of survival. Um, he does not have mange, which is unusual. Usually when we get in juvenile foxes, they have mange and that was part of the issue with them becoming debilitated. But with this fox, we don't see any sign of mange, we don't see any sign of injury, although he's so weak that if he does have an injury that's more subtle, I don't know that we would see it by now. So we'll go in and have a look at him, and is it just an exam at this time that we're... Yeah, I'm thinking to... just lay a blanket down and bring him out, yeah. and just I'm just going to sit there and slowly try to hand feed him. Okay. I don't know how long it's going to take to get enough food into him. All right. He could barely swallow. So hopefully it's better now because we he's got a little bit into him. Yeah, so... All right. All right, ready? Okay, let's go in. Cool. Overnight, the fox has been hydrated, but despite that, he's still showing signs of weakness. This is just cat food with some vitamins added. This is a mixture with Ensure and meat and vitamins. And this is strawberry Ensure with vitamins. He is brighter than when I gave him the sugar. Yeah. Christina, can you grab a stethoscope for me? Yeah. We really don't know the history on this fox, and basically he was found as a juvenile. The question is, is what happened to his parents? What happened to his den? Why is he out by himself? And we really don't know the answer. I'd like to feed her around the clock. Okay, so you're gonna... Let's see how she looks at the end of the day. She does at the end of the day. When she first came in, she was so weak that we couldn't even assess her. So at the time, we just gave her fluids and just some general support. Um, with very simple nutrition, and we really didn't do a full assessment on her. And we actually had given her a little bit of food and tried to stabilize her blood sugar before even doing this, just to give her the energy for it. So I think that what will happen is that in the next few days we'll see how she does. We're going to give her a different type of hydration, put in an IV line on her, um, and also feed her a little bit more aggressively, because she only takes a couple mouthfuls at a time and doesn't really have a lot of strength for swallowing. So. You know, hopefully as she gets more meals, she'll get stronger and stronger. The moment it looks like it might just be a plain, you know, she's been orphaned and now she's gotten herself into a situation where she's very thin and weak and unable to feed herself. Heather is still unable to identify the problem. He's suffering from severe diarrhea and walking on his own seems almost impossible. Without a diagnosis, there is no treatment. And this little fox is getting worse fast. Every year, almost 5,000 animals come through the doors of Toronto Wildlife Centre. 25 full-time staff and hundreds of volunteers work tirelessly to save injured or orphaned animals. Many times, these are success stories. Animals are rehabilitated and soon after released into their original settings. But every once in a while, even hard work and dedication can't save some of the Centre's vulnerable patients. The medical team has diagnosed the orphaned red fox with a deadly and contagious virus. 
The disease that we were worried about is parvovirus and she see, it did seem to have the classic signs of that. She had the very severe diarrhea, um, there's some blood and also there's an odour that the staff were noticing that's very um, distinctive for that viral disease. This disease attacks the digestive system and causes depression, severe diarrhea and vomiting. All the same symptoms the team noticed in this fox. It's a disappointing outcome for this dedicated veterinarian. We decided to make the difficult decision to euthanize this little fox. Um, she was suffering quite a bit and obviously had a problem that she would not be recovering from. Now the cleaning team moves into action. Parvo is a contagious and hardy virus that is able to live on surfaces for months. Every measure is taken to avoid spreading it to the other animals. So as soon as we find out that an animal has a contagious disease such as this, we do shut everything down. Uh, everything is cleaned from that room, everything is sterilized. All the people who have been working with that animal obviously have to change their outfits and we put foot baths outside the doors. We do really go into a shutdown containment mode. Meanwhile, Heather can't help but wish there would have been some way to save this little baby fox. It's always very disappointing when an animal gets that sick and especially with a disease like parvovirus where there aren't that many treatment options. It's very uh, upsetting for all of us. We're all very invested in trying to help them get better and make sure that we're giving them the best care possible, so it's sad. While the center's maintenance team is making sure any traces of parvovirus are wiped away, Andrew and Stacy have found a beautiful new home for their rescued ducks. Karen Taylor, the owner of the condo, has decided to join the team from Toronto Wildlife Centre as they prepare to release this family of 11. At Toronto Wildlife Centre, the goal is to release the animal as close as possible to where it was first captured. You know, it felt like forever getting here, driving here, but it's so close. It's, as a duck flies, it's really close. So I'm sure she knows this stretch. And like I told you, this is where she came last year with her little ones. I think the bear's good. Karen, why don't you come here? We'll have a beautiful view. As Stacy opens the cage by the water's edge, all they can do is wait. These ducklings are between 10 and 15 days old, and it's time for them to swim. The group stays quiet to make sure Mother Duck feels secure about leading her babies out of the safety of the crate. And then it happens. Like ducks to water, literally, these newborn babies easily hop into the pond and begin swimming. So watch how close they stick to her body. If they weren't to stay that close, they might not be able to keep up. They're actually, you know how a race car driver will draft another car? They're drafting her, yeah. So her, the eddies behind her are actually keeping them close. It's all instinct. The group steps away, and Karen takes a moment to reflect on her adventure with the duck family. Did you see her fly in the first time? Yes, I did. And that's when I kind of shoot her off because I didn't really didn't want the stress this year. Yeah. But um, it's stressful for you and for her. And for her. And then um, I thought about it. Uh, I did plant some plants, but she just turfed them out. That's and amazing. As soon as she laid one egg, I knew I, that was it. I couldn't move anything. So I carefully took that egg, put it in a brand new pot, all for her in the corner. Really? Yes. Oh. And she knew that was her spot. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, I bet you she's just like. <laughs> yeah, it's so pretty casual happy. look, huh? No oh, kidding. I'm so happy. Yeah. <laughs> that was fantastic. <laughs> I'm so happy to see her go and be happy and go to her new home. Yeah. You know, she's been on a porch for 35 days, oh so I'm sure she's going to love this and her babies. Yeah.